Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salmar, for your very enlightening presentation. Uh, and now I'm uh, really proud to introduce uh, Professor Joseph uh, Nye, the university distinguished professor and former dean of Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He has served as an assistant director, assistant secretary of Defense and International Security Affairs, chair of the National Intelligence Council, and uh, deputy undersecretary for, of state. For those who have uh, even took an uh, undergraduate uh, course in international relations, Professor Nye is uh, uh, famous uh, and uh, for others as a role model, combining uh, excellent scholarship with uh, policy influence. I'm very happy that uh, we have him here with us. Please, let's welcome him. Thank you. This is a, a great topic, and I agree with what my predecessors have said. Uh, and I also agree that the problem of how to respond to Russia is uh, very complex. Um, let me, before I say some specific things, let me say some general things, which is you can't answer this question with regard to Russia without looking at two aspects of the complex. One is the geopolitical situation and the other is the domestic political situation inside the United States. In the geopolitical situation, as I wrote in a book uh, called Is the American Century Over? I think uh, Russia is a country in decline. Uh, if you look at the demography or the dependence on energy for two-thirds of its exports or the total inability to adapt the society to the changes it needs, I think it has a long-run de decline. And people think Putin is a wonderful strategist. He's not. He's a tactician. A strategist would figure out how to solve these long-run problems. But P Putin is a brilliant tactician. One of the problems with this is that declining states often take more risks. That was Austria-Hungary in 1914. And Putin takes risks. So a lot of what we're going to see in this area of hybrid warfare or information warfare or uh, that Jackie so ably described in the introduction uh, means that Putin is going to take risks there. And his current activity besides the, the problems related to Ukraine and Crimea and so forth has been to escape from the isolation. He's been quite successful at this. I mean, uh, here he has uh, he got the World Cup uh, uh, circus as his, um, as his stage. He has the, uh, uh, he's now had uh, Trump uh, talk about restoring the G8 and having a summit with Putin. So tactically, uh, the situation is very complex because we're going to be facing an opponent who is going to take risks in this area and who is a very clever tactician. Uh, so that's the geopolitical context for the measures we might take. The domestic uh, political context is also difficult. Uh, people say, oh, you can't deter Russia as the 2016 uh, case proves. Um, if you look at Jason Healy's recent writing, which says that we're more deterred than they are, you really can't derive much of a lesson from 2016. 2016 was a unique conjuncture of American domestic politics. And one of the reasons that I'm told by friends who were in the White House at the time, one of the reasons that the American response was so weak was the fear by the Obama people that what, if they responded more harshly to the Russians, that they would jeopardize Hillary Clinton's chances in the election. It was a miscalculation, but nonetheless, that domestic political factor led them to have a very pusillanimous or weak response, uh, which of course then undercut <coughs> deterrence. It's not clear that that always has to be the case, but it certainly was in 2016. And uh, if you look at uh, 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 David Sanger's book that's just coming out this week, uh, uh, called the perfect weapon, he goes into some description of the of of this uh, the reasons why the Americans responded so weakly 
before the election because of the domestic political situation. And it remains difficult because now with the Mueller investigation uh, in the United States, looking at to what extent there was uh, a conspiracy uh, in relation to Russia's participation in the election, you have the president, President Trump, consistently trying to delegitimize both the press and the Mueller investigation and the FBI. So it's so the prospects that you're going to get a sensible strategy uh, are very complicated because of the domestic political situation. And that's probably not going to change um, uh, at least until the Mueller investigation is over or more likely until after the uh, uh, 2020 election. So that's just to give you the context. Within that problem, I mean that context, uh, rather than repeat what uh, others have, uh, have said, um, if you say, what should we be doing as a response? I have a, a former student, uh, Tim Maurer, who's a, uh, uh, originally from Germany, um, who's written a very interesting paper called Russian Election Interference. And what he's done is looked at the European cases of responses to the Russian interference in elections, uh, the Dutch elections, the French elections, the German elections, British elections, and so forth. And he comes up with the following list, which is not a bad uh, list for what the Americans could do, or the lessons that the Americans could do, if we had the capacity to develop a strategy. As I just said, I don't think now we have the capacity to develop a strategy, but we someday will, I believe. And let me just, rather than re repeat it all, just give you his, his list, which I found very useful. Issue a clear warning that interference uh, will have severe consequences, in other words, deterrence. Coordinate government efforts to protect against uh, cyber attacks. Provide more training and support to state and local election officials. We have a project at Harvard that Eric Rosenbach and Michael and my friend uh, is organizing on this. Encourage states to reevaluate the use of electronic voting machines. There's still some states that have this. Um, the uh, encourage political parties and their candidates and staff to follow basic cybersecurity practices. We also have a project where we were working with political campaigns on a bipartisan basis. Encourage donors to require the political parties and campaigns implement basic uh, uh, procedures, urge political parties to explicitly state they will not use or support social media bots, uh, increase society's resilience by clearly communicating the risks that they will encounter from foreign interference in our campaigns, promote independent citizen fact-checking, uh, and improve media literacy among the public. This is, there's nothing unique or special about this list, what it reinforces is the earlier messages. There's no one single silver bullet. Uh, but there are a series of things you can take to increase re resilience and the robustness uh, to make it more difficult. And what the, the Maurer paper points out is this has worked in some of the European elections. So it's not as though this is an impossible wish list. Uh, it's, it's the basis of how you might develop a strategy, even if we're not capable right now of developing a strategy. But let me, let me pick out a couple of particular points in, within that list, particularly the, the, those points relating to deterrence. And I hate, hesitate to say this with Martin in the audience, who's, the, who's the, uh, written some of the best on, uh, work on, on cyber uh, deterrence in the cyber realm. But it seems to me that what we've seen in, in, in terms of deterrence, you can have uh, deterrence by denial, uh, which means raising the threshold, which changes the workload factor. It doesn't prevent it, but it does mean it makes easy targets uh, less attractive, and then Jackie referred to that. Um, you can also have deterrence by punishment, which is uh, uh, she referred to also, and you can have deterrence by norms. Now, on deterrence uh, by denial, some of the measures that are on the Maurer list would, would be examples uh, of this. You, you make it more difficult or more costly. Um, 
I want to focus for a second on deterrence by uh, punishment. There you can imagine intra-domain and cross-domain deterrence. Cross-domain deterrence means that I will put on sanctions or, or punish. And that's what we've done so far. I mean, we've expelled some diplomats. Uh, we've uh, put people on a list uh, uh, of, you know, was it 13 Russian individuals and organizations uh, have their assets frozen and so on uh, and so forth. Um, the interesting question is, should we be reinforcing this by intra-domain deterrence, which means essentially doing things back within cyber. Uh, my own feeling is that we probably should, and there's a, in the article that was drawn from Sanger's book that was published in the New York Times on Sunday, he argues there was a big discussion inside the government in the Obama years about should we do this or not, and that some officials said don't go down that road, and the, the, the simplistic way of putting this is people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw computers. And the, the argument here is that we live in the glassiest house. Yes, we have the best capabilities, but we're the most vulnerable. I think that's probably a mistaken way of thinking about it. I think if you develop a strategy, you could imagine certain intra-domain attacks uh, which could either uh, they could be modest or, or, or uh, so that you try to control for uh, escalation dominance, but that they would help if combined with diplomacy, working with our allies and explaining to the Russians what we're doing, they would help to indicate that we're serious about this. And until we indicate more seriousness, uh, I'm not sure that we're going to have uh, the deterrent effect we need. So yes, deterrence by denial and the questions that uh, were on the Maurer list, we should do that anyway. Uh, whether we should limit ourselves just to cross-domain sanctions, treasury measures, and so forth, uh, I think we probably need to go a bit beyond that. But the question is how, if you do that, how do you prevent it from getting out of hand? And it has to be part of an all-government uh, strategy which includes uh, uh, coordination from the White House and uh, a diplomatic aspect of the strategy. That then brings me to my final point, which is, is it possible to imagine that in a situation like this, since there's not going to be a technical solution to Russian uh, 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 use of fake news, uh, there are lots of things you do, but there's not going to be one quick fix. Um, is it possible to imagine a diplomatic negotiation? And people say, oh, out of the question, you know, we and the Russians are at loggerheads, there's no common ground and so forth. I remind you that during the Cold War, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were bitterly opposed, and the threat was existential, and yet we managed to negotiate a series of agreements which, uh, uh, like the Limited Test Ban Treaty, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the SALT Treaty, and so forth, uh, is it possible to imagine a situation where after threatening this intra-domain deterrence, maybe even applying a bit of it, we could say to the Russians, let's have a negotiation in which we don't totally abandon the information warfare, we never expect you to do that, but in which you keep it to a low level, in which you don't do beyond a certain amount of things or else, and then we will use more of this interdomain uh, punishment if you do. Um, I, th I think it would make sense to add that diplomatic component to the strategy. After all, we did this with incidents at sea with the Russians, so forth. Could you do sort of an incidents at sea type negotiation uh, which would get the Russians to back away from some of that Yurasimov doctrine that, that Jackie talked about. My problem with that is not, is that a good component or important component of the strategy? My problem with it is figuring out how to do it. Uh, and it, it's it, it, because one of the things it runs into is First Amendment problems at home. Uh, suppose the Russians did say, okay, if you've frozen my bank accounts or you've disclosed this or whatever it is, you're, 
doing to punish me, um, I, then and I agree not to put fake ads on Facebook or use bots on Twitter uh, for political purposes or whatever. And that's the that's the incident C tribe type agreement we reach. Um, does the United States have the capacity to say the National Endowment for Democracy will not go and try to stimulate a green revolution in Moscow, that we aren't going to go support Navalny or whatever? And that goes into some of the First Amendment uh, type questions. And it really goes to the point of, of, of how do we uh, look at the questions that both uh, 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 Jackie and, and Michael raised about making sure we stay true to our own values in this. There was an article uh, written or a piece that was done last year by the National Endowment for Democracy which talked about sharp power. And sometimes people confuse sharp power and soft power. Soft power is the ability to get what you want through attraction. Sharp power is the ability to use information to disrupt and, and uh, harm. They're, they're, they both use information. The fact that they're using information doesn't mean they're the same thing. It's the intent in which the information is used which distinguishes sharp and hard power. We have to do more to combat Russian sharp power without destroying our own values, avoiding the mirror, image, mirror imaging, so that we maintain our own soft power. And I wrote a little piece in uh, Foreign Affairs uh, earlier this year distinguishing sharp and, uh, and, and soft power, saying, yes, let's take some measures which are much stricter against the Russians uh, to combat their sharp power, but we've got to be careful that we don't do it in a way which undercuts our own soft power, which is one of our great assets. And that's going to be the, the heart of the problem. So, Develop a list like Maurer's list of deterrence by denial, but as we go to the issues of deterrence by punishment, particularly intra-domain, let's make sure that we find out ways to do it without losing our own comparative advantage, which is to maintain a First Amendment and uh, a degree of freedom of speech and press. So uh, easier said than done, but at least it gives us some guidelines of how we should be thinking about this. Thank you.